here we go. So I'm going to use the edge of this. I'm already wearing protective glasses because this will cause a big, big spark. So please don't try this at home. So here we go. I'm going to connect the two terminals together. Ready? Here we go. I had my eyes closed, so I hope you guys saw that. Um, so that was the entire charge in the capacitor going through the short circuit tip of this. You can see it actually damaged the tip of my uh, of my exo exacto knife here. I don't know if you can that wouldn't focus on this very well. But now you can see that the voltage across the capacitor went down all the way to about minus 7 volts. So let's now do the same thing, but this time let's take this to the oscilloscope and connect the, uh, the probe on the voltage that I was telling you about on the node I was telling you about. I'm interested in seeing. I'm interested in looking at this voltage right here and seeing the oscillation I was telling you about. So let's take a look at that. Okay, here we are at the oscilloscope. I'm going to be using my older scope for this because uh, I'm going to be putting a very large voltage in it and I don't want to risk damaging my new digital scope. You can buy one of these older CRT based scopes from eBay for about $200. They're very useful. I highly recommend it. So here's the flash circuit. It's already powered up uh, using my power supply on the left. And I'm, I'm not running this at its full capacity. I'm running it only from uh, 0.6 volts because I don't want to create a very large voltage. I just want to demonstrate the principle of operation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the oscilloscope probe and look at the voltage right before and after the diode. So let me see if I can get this to focus. Uh, there we go, almost. Right, so here you can see the diode right there. And I'm going to look at the voltage before and after the diode so we can see the peak detection and also the large voltage swing I was telling you about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the negative terminal of my 10 to 1 probe. And it's important that this is a 10 to 1 probe. So I will connect that to the negative voltage of the power supply. I will take this cap off. And then we will focus, zoom in a little bit more on the display. So you can see the display of the scope is set to 50 volts per division, meaning each of these vertical lines, uh, these vertical the divisions is 50 volts. So there's eight of them in total. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So 400 volts of peak-to-peak -peak signal can fit in this display. And that right now, the middle line is the ground, so the signal in the middle is zero volts. So I will connect it right where I was saying, right after the, uh, right before the diode. But I'm going to have to do that from the opposite side of the um, PCB because I cannot really reach that. So I flip it over. Uh, this this is after the diode and this is before the diode. So I will put this on the ground and then I will connect it. There we go. Right there. So you can see there is an excess of 400 volts peak to peak of swing there. The negative swing is clipped at the bottom. You can see the bottom part is clipped. The reason is because that's where the diode starts conducting and therefore the capacitor starts to charge. So that voltage does not go below there because the capacitor is so, so big that clips the voltage at the bottom. But you can see that right now uh, the voltage across the capacitor uh, you can tell by where the clipping happens, must be around minus 200, minus 250 volts. And if I connect this right to the capacitor, you can see that it goes below the vertical uh, division, uh, below the, the lowest point here, is because it's less than minus 200 volts. So there's one other thing we can uh, get from this. If I connect it, we can measure the frequency of oscillation. Each horizontal division is 50 microseconds. So if I connect it, we can see that the cycle repeats once every 100 microseconds. That's equal to 10 kilohertz. 10 kilohertz is audible, means you can hear 10 kilohertz. And in fact, you must have realized whenever you turn one of these things on that it makes that really annoying high frequency pitch. The reason that happens is because the frequency of oscillation is within the audible range and the coils in the transformer vibrate ever so slightly because of so much current in them and the magnetic field shifts them left and right very little just enough so that you can hear so the whole circuit emits sound uh, when it's operating so that's another reason why it makes that noise 
So what I'm going to do now is that now we have spoken a lot about how this circuit works, looked at some of the voltage of the oscillation and a whole bunch of other uh, characteristics. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect this to a Nixie tube and then see if we can power a Nixie tube with one of these things. So let's move back to the other side and let's try to do that. So here I have a Nixie tube. This Nixie tube shows numbers between 0 to 9 and it has also two decimal points. So the way these Nixie tubes work is that the, the gas inside this tube is a low pressure neon, sometimes mixed with mercury and argon. And you have around on the outside, you may be able to see it, there's this mesh that's connected all the way around and at the back is a solid plate and it's connected to one of these pins, that's an, the anode pin. And what ends up happening is by putting a large potential difference between this mesh on the outside and the little numbers on the inside that you may be able to see, you're going to excite the neon gas that's in there and the neon gas is going to glow. The exact principle of operation of how that happens and the physics that goes into it is an interesting read. I suggest that you take a look at it, but the principle of operation is what I said. The gas gets excited the electrons move to higher energy bands on their way back down. Um, they emit uh, light in the frequency and the wavelength that we are able to see. And that happens near the cathode um, element, the, the cathode um, elements of this Nixie tube. And why does it happen near the cathode element? Now, there's a little bit of physics that goes in there too. I recommend that you take a look at it. But in order to turn one of these things on, you need to apply somewhere between 150, 160 or volts between the anode and the cathode of this, uh, of this particular model and then you'll be able to turn those numbers on. These guys were invented and used back in the 40s or the 50s when uh, seven segment displays and LCD displays and vacuum fluorescent displays weren't available yet and you could show numbers with these. So if you ever have had an old um, HP or a very old measurement equipment, you will be able to find these Nixie tubes used as a display. Very, very popular. A lot of people build uh, very cool things with these, like clocks or uh, some sort of uh, um, display, depending on what kind of Nixie tube you can get a hold of. I got a batch of 10 of them from eBay a while back. I can't remember, maybe about $50 or so. Very cool things to play with. But of course, because they need 150 volts or so to turn them on, they're not the easiest things to use. So you will need a DC-DC converter. So I thought, why not, let's try and power one of these things using a flash circuit because a flash circuit is capable of giving us that kind of voltages. So what I've done is that I've taken one of these guys and I have just placed it on top of one of these breadboards so that all the legs are nicely separated and there is a, a little resistor that's connected to the anode. So this wire right here is going to connect to the anode and every one of the other wires, the cathodes, are going to be connected to um, the potential that will turn it on and then you, could, you should be able to see those numbers. So I'm going to uh, connect everything up, show you how it's connected and then let's see if we can power it on. And then, uh, as the last thing, we're going to measure the efficiency of the DC-DC converter based on how much power is delivered to the Nixie tube and how much power is required to, uh, for the flash rigger to run. So let's do that. So let's see what I've done here. I have connected the flash circuit to the power supply so it's powered on. I'm monitoring the voltage of the capacitor simultaneously like I was doing before on the multimeter. I am connecting the anode to ground and I'm connecting one of the cathodes to the negative terminal of the capacitor. This is because remember this produces negative voltage with respect to the ground of the power supply. So at the same time, I am measuring the voltage that is connected to the flash, the current that's connected to the f that is being provided to the flash, the voltage across the capacitor, and the current that is given to the Nixie tube. So if I were to multiply this current by this voltage, that's the power delivered to the Nixie tube. If I were to multiply this number, with this number, that's the power delivered to the flash unit. So by dividing the result of this to this, I can get the efficiency of the DC-DC converter afterwards. But let's first turn on the Nixie tube and see what happens. So let me go all the way down. 
let me bring the NIST tube into view like so and I'm going to increase the voltage in the power supply until this guy turns on here we go Should, there we go here it is and it's showing the number 8 I can sh show other numbers by connecting it to the other numbers for example here's number 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and at the back that's 9 and you can also turn 1 and other ones but I, I don't want to reach the back all the way back just in case I will short circuit the, the wires so let's connect it back to number 8 so the, the thing that makes these Nixie tubes really cool is is the fact that the numbers are not all on the same plane so it gives it this weird 3D look as I go across the numbers the numbers go back and forth and I think that's a really cool retro look that you could uh, incorporate in uh, one of your future projects so you can see a bit closer the number 8 is glowing really nicely it has a very nice orange glow color to it so I'm going to put this down on the ground leave this number 8 on so we can measure now the efficiency of the DC-DC converter so let's put this back down here while it's on let's go up and look at these numbers here we go so the power supply is set to 0.8 volts and is drawing 386 milliamps so let's say for the sake of to make it easy in the calculation let's say this was 400 milliamps so that would be 0 0.32 watts 320 milliwatts of power is being delivered to the flash DC DC converter the voltage across the capacitor is 133 volts negative 133 volts and the current going to the Nixie tube is 1.2 milliamps so if you multiply 1.2 milliamps by 133 and divide that by about 320 milliwatts you get just over 50 percent so the efficiency, the DC-DC converter efficiency for turning one of these Nixie tubes on using a flash from a disposable flash camera is only f about 50% which is, well, very bad because you can make DC-DC converters that are easily um, more efficient than 80% but for hacking purposes and for something that would have otherwise been thrown out and for educational purposes I think this is a great project that if you have some experience dealing with high voltages I strongly recommend that you try it out especially if you've never played with Nixie tubes these things are, uh, are really really neat and they're not that expensive you can get them in all kind of patterns it doesn't have to be numbers sometimes you can have them as bars or something else so I strongly recommend that you try this out and then uh, you see what you can do with it just be very 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 careful Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode playing with flash circuits and AC tubes and I hope that we learned a thing or two about how these things operate. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to break this video up again into multiple sections because YouTube doesn't allow me to upload anything that's more than 15 minutes. But if you guys watch these videos and uprank them, then YouTube will eventually allow me to put the entire episode in one video so you don't have to keep clicking. So please make sure you discuss this in the um, comment section and also don't forget to answer the quiz that I asked about why the neon light flashes uh, as opposed to LED that doesn't. And whoever gets the answer right will um, choose the next topic of the next episode. We have a lot of videos and a lot of equipment to review and a lot of interesting things coming in the future. So make sure you check back, subscribe and um, see you soon.